Caroline Roth, and you're listening to Spirit of the Dawn Podcast 10. Today, we'll be exploring unconditional love with spiritual teachers Michael and Carolyn Rhodes. Every single day since when I awake, I feel the same. Somehow I have changed. Where do the people of the street? Yeah, made me feel it Somehow life is sweeter every day Somehow life is sweeter every day hey, uh, You've gotta find a time to change Gotta find the time to find this time to embrace The colors, fine lines and shades It makes this place, it makes this place great I'll embrace the change Whoa, 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 I'll embrace the change uh, Whoa, whoa From beautiful Ashland, Oregon, I am Pleiadian Emissary of Light, Caroline Ra. Thank you all for joining me today. Welcome to Spirit of the Dawn. We are in for a treat today, a consciousness-expanding, life-changing treat. I invite you to relax and welcome new into your life, a new relationship with yourself, a relationship based on unconditional love and emotional balance. That is the message of my guests today, Michael and Carolyn Rhodes. Michael is the author of numerous books focusing on the nature of reality, his metaphysical journeys, and his personal evolution in consciousness. Michael and Carolyn leave their home in Australia each year and travel throughout the world spreading the love bug during a series of very popular five-day intensives and talks. I am excited Michael and Carolyn will once again be visiting the United States this July of 2016. We'll be sharing all of the details with you later on in the show. Are you ready to end your inner struggle and create inner peace? To choose a new life without self-criticism, judgment, and blame? Then let's welcome to Spirit of the Dawn, Michael and Carolyn Rhodes. Michael and Carolyn, thank you so much for joining with us today. It's our pleasure. Yes, thank you, Caroline. Thank you for having us. I absolutely love talking with you. This is, I think, the fifth time I've interviewed Michael, and I love every second of it. And I am wondering, do we bring these patterns of self-criticism with us from lifetime to lifetime? Yeah, we, um, we keep everything with us unless we resolve it. Anything of the past unresolved is unresolved now. And so when we have things like self-criticism, self-judgment, etc., etc., everything of our, all our emotional issues go with us. And so, you know, how many people actually go through a life without self-criticism? And so it becomes part of the subconscious. Some people are very deeply self-critical and really beat themselves up badly, and others are much more mildly so. Uh, I used to be very self-critical. Now I've stopped it entirely. I've got a wife, and she can do that for me. No, that's a joke. (laughs) No, that is a joke. I call it creative suggestions. Yeah, she never (laughs) criticizes me. They're always creative suggestions. Oh, I like that. I'm going to write that down. (laughs) Something smart like that. Great. Okay. Now I know what to call them, creative suggestions. Very good. (laughs) Okay. What is the alternative to beating ourselves up? When we choose to experience another way of working our lives and experiencing our life, what are some methods we can do to keep on track without beating ourselves up when when we revert to the old patterns? This is why I talk about um, choosing love. You know, we uh, have to choose our thoughts. But the average person thinks around about 60,000 thoughts a day, and most of those thoughts, psychologists agree, are pretty self-critical. And so instead of... Um, the thing is, that self-criticism is automatic, it's subconscious, and so we're not listening to it. And so a lot of people say, well, I haven't been criticizing myself today, and yet they basically have, but there's such a constant background flow that they just don't listen to it anymore. But if you're going to, so in other words, you don't choose self-criticism. It's, it's a part of a program. But to end it, 
You've got to be much more conscious and much much more aware. You've got to literally choose love. You've got to make a choice not to be caught up in the old um, subconscious um, inner mantra of not good enough. When we see this pattern in our children, are they modeling our behavior? And is there a way that we can raise children to be more consciously evolved? Oh, absolutely, but it would require the parents to be more consciously involved. In other words, if a, con a parent had no interest in growing in consciousness, they would probably um, not get their children to grow in consciousness unless the children, when they're adults, leave the parents behind, which is a common scenario. But if the parents... Um, you know, live their life in a way that is based in love and thoughtfulness, self-worth and self-esteem, well, that obviously will spill over into the children. In other words, that's a learned behavior until, until you have that level of inner love, that unconditional love for yourself. And then you don't need to learn it anymore. It becomes a natural expression. I'd like to ask Carolyn what she thinks of that. Well, I would agree with that. I, I also think for teaching anyone, children or anyone, the best method is through example, is through the way we handle our own lives, the way we respond and, instead of react, and the way we treat other people and the way we treat ourselves. And when our children see that, that's the example that they will follow, that they'll pattern after. We can't tell them one thing and be something else. That's a complete contradiction, so that sure. never works. Right. It's so interesting. I met... The tail end of raising kids, you know, they're all, they're basically grown up now, but I still know that the thoughts that I have and how I handle my life and my relationship with myself still affects them. It still gets handed down, even if the kids aren't in your house anymore. So it's, it's a very interesting process. Valentine's Day is coming up. I don't know. Is Valentine's Day celebrated in Australia? Yeah. It is. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that we celebrate it. Every day is Valentine's Day, right? <laughs> I know that, and that is what I'd like to discuss. It's so interesting in romantic relationships. So many times we think of it as such an important part of our lives, yet we put negative energy and criticism into it. We bring our own neediness to a relationship. What does an emotionally balanced relationship look like? And I'm asking experts right now. If you could share with us, that would be amazing. Well, I think you should definitely have Carolyn's point of view on this. But uh, I think, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting word. You say relationships. When I was young, I, I, we didn't have relationships. You fell in love and got married. Now... Love doesn't seem to be part of it, and people want relationships for emotional security more than anything. You know, sometimes I ask a couple who are struggling, okay, well, do you love him or do you love her? And they look at you like completely blank, like love. Um, it's like the song, what's love got to do with that? That, I find, is rather sad. So I think when you fall in love and get married... Is there a tie, is there a use by date? Do you fall out of love? I mean, I never do. I just sort of fall in love and stay in love. So I fell in love with Carolyn. I'm still in love with her. And I tell her so every day. And, um, and I act as best I can. There are moments when I'm not the best. But I act as if I love her because I simply do. And so acts become loving. Thoughts become loving. Your emotions hinge around love because love is not an emotion. Love is the power of creation. And so when you're loving someone, you're creating with them. You're co-creating a beautiful relationship. That's the only part where relationship comes into it. So what do you think, my darling? Well, I think it's important, first of all, to have a very balanced relationship within yourself. Um, I think oftentimes people come into relationships and they and they see someone and they and they want that person to full, to fill all their emotional holes and that is never ever possible and so I think the more balanced we are within our own beings um, the less we need to may have someone else make us happy because we make ourselves happy and I think for Michael and I uh, we have we had both reached that point in our lives when we were married where we were 
pretty emotionally balanced, I'd say, certainly more than most people we meet. And uh, and that was a big plus for us. That was a very good platform for us to, to come together on. I don't look at him and expect him to make me happy in any way. I don't expect him to change or be anything other than exactly the way he is. I love him exactly with nothing to change. And he does some crazy things. He's got some crazy quirks and things that make me, what? That make me giggle. <laughs> But that's perfect. It's perfect. It's exactly the way he is. It's the man I love. And, you know, I think that's that's the key to it. Just to You really love my quaint voice. You know, <laughs> that's what one thing that grinds on me. He uses a seventy year old voice. I said he's either the seven hundred year old or the seven year old or the seventy year old. Well actually now it's almost eighty years, but <laughs> he's got a crazy voice I don't like and, and I just like hold my fingers over my ears and laugh and walk away. But Gosh. and we don't take ourselves seriously. That's another thing before I let Michael take back over again. Okay, we take life very lightly we take ourselves lightly and I think that's a huge benefit as well so do you feel that when we're you know oh no you know they're doing that again and I don't like that and I need for them to change we really need to stop and say no they're fine I need to work on something inside myself right now and I need to evolve in a way Yes, I would say that that would be true. And but with that said, you know, when we say choose love in, in in regard to relationships, it doesn't mean that you're a doormat. If you're with someone that really is unpleasant, who you who you realize your time with is is finished, you're not enriching and enhancing each other's lives. You're not growing anymore. You know, as I always say, that till death do us part. That's a very human thing. You know, on a spiritual level, when you stop growing together, then your time together is done, and you. You move apart in love and you don't it's not it doesn't mean putting up with with behavior that is really um, bringing you down you know that's when choosing love is walking away walking away in a loving way also um, choosing love you choose love for yourself if you're in a poor relationship or abusive relationship um, a lot of people get the idea they've got to love this other person um, but then they're loving that other person, which is probably impossible, at the expense of loving themselves. So the first, when you're loving unconditionally, when you first apply that love to yourself, because until you're loving yourself, you're not really loving anybody else. I know this takes it into deeper water, but there's nothing, there's nothing out there. There is nobody outside of self. There's no one outside of self. And so when you're in a situation, oh, I just love him, it doesn't matter if he's horrible every now and again, or she is horrible every now and again, I mean, that's not love at all, that's just putting up with. And a lot of people don't seem to realize the difference between choosing love for themselves, putting up with other people. Um, it becomes a very clouded issue for many people simply because they never really experience what love is for themselves. So they have to guess at what it is or what it might be. And love is the power of creation. That's when Michael or I refer to unconditional love. We mean the power of creation, not the mm, 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 kiss you on the cheek and everything is all perfect all the time. I mean, that's like an emotional love. And that's not, that's not the love that, that we refer to when we say unconditional love. It's so interesting. I hear both of you often say love is the power of creation and not an emotion. And I absolutely love that, pun intended. Can you explain that more deeply? Because for some people listening, it's the first time they're actually hearing that concept. Well, if you were in an aeroplane and um, the pilot announces that the engines have failed and it begins to fall out the air, you're going to have a very powerful emotional experience, right? Right. Absolutely. A very powerful emotional experience. So the, what is causing this powerful emotional experience? What's causing it is the plane is plunging toward the ground and you're expecting to die. So you're in a very powerful emotional experience. Um, the emotions have been triggered by the plane falling and they're not good emotions. When we experience love, truly experience real love, our emotions rise up in that because love lifts our emotions this has been going on for so long that this emotional lift, which we so enjoy, 
people began to identify that with love. That is love, but that isn't love. Love is the vehicle, like the aeroplane that's plunging down. Love is the vehicle that is lifting us up. So instead of plunging our emotions down, love lifts our emotions to a whole new high. And then we tend to think that love is an emotion, but love is the power of creation. An emotion didn't create this planet. An emotion didn't create the universe or humanity. Love is the power of creation. And so when you're loving yourself, you're recreating yourself. In fact, when you're um, in a relationship or marriage like Carolyn and I, and we're each loving ourselves and each other, then there is a co-creation taking place where we're each lifting the other and lift what well, because we're lifting ourselves. So you're lifting the relationship to a higher place because we're each lifting ourselves to a higher place. Therefore, the um, relationship reflects it. But, but, you know, I could say a lot more as regards to love. Michael and Carolyn, I once heard Michael talk about marriage. Some people don't get married but have beautiful, committed relationships, and other people get married and... Sometimes they have a joyful time together and sometimes they don't. More and more people are valuing the relationship and not the legal certificate. Can you comment on that? Well, I think um, that's a tricky area because it's, so, it's such a personal thing. Like for me, marriage is like creating a... It creates a bridge between two people. So when you... Publicly, you have a marriage, which is in, in front of the public, and you each commit to each other and make vows. In a way, you're creating like a metaphysical bridge between two people. And so if some say that marriage is in trouble, then the commitment you've made to each other in this marriage has a, um, it's like a bridge that you can walk on and meet each other. So marriage to me is rather like a, is, is very much based in a commitment. Now, a lot of people don't like committing to anything. They've never committed to themselves. And so a lot of people who have a, a non-marriage relationship, which is a, like a partnership, some of them can't commit. Others commit totally in a partnership and just don't see any point in, in a ceremony, which I fully respect. I think there's also a backlash against religion and churches, etc. Um, you know, why would why do we need to go to a church when we don't? Um, legalizing it with a piece of paper, some do that. Some it becomes legalized anyway in a common law marriage. And so, to me, it's a marriage whether you, if you're living with somebody and you're working on a relationship between you. It's a marriage, whether they call it partnership, whether it's been done in church, whether it's got a piece of paper behind it, none of that makes any difference. However, let's also, let me tell you a little story. When my youngest son got married, in fact, I was best man at the wedding. And after the wedding, I said to him, okay, I said, now you're, you've had, now you're wedded, your marriage will begin in about two and a half years. And he was a bit dismissive of me in those days. And he said, oh, Dad, what are you talking about? I said, you'll see. About two and a quarter years later, he said to me, I think I see what you meant now, Dad. I said, what's that? I, he said, about the marriage. I said, oh, yes. I said, it takes about two and a half years to get through the first um, time of sexuality where you can sort of have sex swimming from the chandeliers you you're completely in a sexual overwhelm and it's wonderful but then eventually as that euphoria wears off there has to be something after the sex there's got to be something that holds a marriage together that holds two people together because sexuality itself doesn't cut it and so after about two and a half years of the wedding that's when quite often the marriage begins, and for many, that's when the struggle begins. And then they'll look outside of themselves and blame all finances and all blame this and blame that. But the truth is, in both of them, the, the gloss, the, the novelty is worn off. 
and now you're with this person for the rest of your life. Do you even like them? Once the you know, once you put aside the wonderful sex, do you even like this person as an everyday partner? And sometimes they find that they don't, and then they're in trouble straight away. What would you say about that? Well, I would say I think it's it's a, as Michael started out by saying it's a very personal choice for ever, everyone. Um, you know, when we were when we were married, actually, <laughs> I did. <laughs> I didn't think it was necessary for us to get married. We were clearly committed to each other in consciousness. And at our age, uh, you know, we weren't having children or, or anything anymore. And I thought that we wouldn't, it wouldn't be necessary. In fact, when Michael proposed to me, <laughs> he said very romantically, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so we still sort of, we still sort of giggle at that. But, you know, we talked about it, and I, re I recognized it was for us. And, and in that regard, he and I are both rather old-fashioned in that way. I think this is a new, a new thing, you know, partners and not getting married. And I don't think it's necessary to have a legal piece of paper to say that you're committed in consciousness. I completely agree with that. No, I agree. But it's a, very, it's a very, very personal thing. But for us, it works. And it works for many reasons as well. I mean, for when I, when I immigrated, it made it much easier. And when we travel, it makes it much easier to, to go in as man and wife, you know, to different countries and everything. And, you know, and it's good. I mean, it works for us. But again, it's a very individual, it's an individual choice. Yeah. It is very individual. I totally understand that. Carolyn, I have a question. You and I both had long marriages that ended in divorce. For me, it was a very joyful and empowering experience, divorce was, and I put a lot of positive energies into a joyful divorce, which I think worked out so beautifully for everyone, children and my ex-husband. You came from that experience. Were you hesitant to get married again? Um, well, to me, to beautiful me. <laughs> Well, first of all, let me say that I've known Michael for over 20 years, so we had, we knew each other, we'd been through each other through the best of times, through the worst of times, we were very, very close friends, so that was a really solid platform to move forward, and we suddenly looked at each other and recognized one day that our, our friendship love had turned into a romantic love, and that we really wanted to, to spend the rest of our lives together, but with that said, as I said before, I really didn't see a reason to get married again in when we first came together, I did have marriage to Jimmy, I call him my husband. When that ended, that was a very, very difficult time for me, a very, very difficult time. I was absolutely gutted. But then that led to an enormous leap in consciousness. So would I want to go through it again? No, but I wouldn't have missed it for all the world. It was really the best thing that ever happened to me. And now we are very, very close. We communicate all the time. And we were really through the whole thing as well. In fact, when we went and got the divorce, we were standing in front of the judge holding hands. And, and the judge looked at us and he said, I've never seen such an amicable divorce in my life. He said, are, are you too sure you want to get divorced? But that was the point that it had evolved to at that time. So, you know, I think life always gets it right. Even when we think it's the worst possible thing that can happen to us, in retrospect, when you look back, it's always for our highest good and growth in consciousness. And that's exactly what it was for me. Well, thank you for sharing that. I know it's very personal. Uh, the judge at, at my ex-husband and my divorce also made a speech about how wonderful we were. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of cool. It's really neat. There's so many things that you guys teach and your intensives are absolutely amazing. I would like to share some of the details of the intensive that you're going to be having here. You're going to be coming back to the United States. And in July of 2016, on July 7th, Michael's going to be giving an evening talk at Unity Temple on the plaza in Kansas City, Missouri. And on July 11th to 15th, you will be offering your intensive at the beautiful event facility, Unity Village. And I invite people to visit michaelroadsusa.com to learn more about that event here in the United States or to write organizer Thane Kraut at info at michaelroadsusa.com. And you travel all over and for... To learn more about the events in other countries, please visit michaelroads.com. And uh, 
which leads me into asking about the intensives. Is each intensive different and unique? Well, I think, um, I mean, really, yeah, of course it is. It's always it's different, it's different and unique, but uh, you know, there is a basic truth behind what I teach. I mean, every spiritual teacher um, has so many ways. How many ways can they find to say a, a truth that remains pretty much unchanging? Now, that's an interesting comment. Um, truth actually keeps expanding but it expands in ways that are not intellectual. So as regards to expressing it, you know, there are only so many ways you can describe a cat. You know, you can, um, you can get very creative and you can describe a cat from the inside out and from the outside in and how it works. But at the end, you've still got a cat. And so truth, uh, um, spiritual truth is like this. There's only so many ways you can describe it. Um, nevertheless, because I don't have a script, when I do a five-day, I'm very much in the moment and a lot of new things keep coming because every year I'm a new person. And if I'm a new person, then there is new truths being expressed. On the, on the other hand, if a person who comes there one year and then another year, if they have remained the same, they won't hear a new truth they will only hear the truths that they are still working on. And so, but if everybody comes there and we're all um, in the moment and um, living um, as being as much in the moment as possible, then it's an utterly unique and dynamic experience. And so I'm being really very honest. I can say, yes, of course it's unique, simply because I am, and so everybody else is there. And by uniqueness is something that is, you know, to look at it in another way, it's something, uniqueness remains while you're in the moment. Once you become a monologue that works, then that, uh, that disappears. I do my best to avoid monologues. I'm aware of them and I don't like them. I've heard spiritual teachers. Um, I don't listen to a lot of them, uh, not because they don't have good things to say, because I'm more inclined to say it. But over the years, I have listened to some spiritual teachers simply because I've been in a conference with them. And sometimes I've heard them saying exactly what they were talking about 10 and even 20 years ago, almost word for word. Now, I understand that. I don't blame them for that. When I think back to Peter Caddy, he was very repetitive, the Finhorn man. But, you know, he was describing something and he told me once, I've described it every way I can think of. I can't think of any more ways to describe it. And I could sympathize with that. I understood exactly what he meant. And so uniqueness is about really about being in the moment, but it requires two people. One, the teacher to be in the moment, to be unique, and the listeners. And then you get a real dynamic place to be. It becomes extremely dynamic. What I always say is when you start doing it, he'll stop saying it. Because <laughs> I, a lot of the things are new, but then there's a lot of things as well that Michael just drums into their heads over and over and over again because it is absolutely essential for them to grow that they need to move into that next level. It's difficult sometimes. I mean, we have people that have attended intensives maybe four, five, six times, and they'll come up to me and they'll go, oh, my God, I heard it for the first time. I, I really, yeah. and, they, and they were hearing yeah. it from their heart. I tell people, listen with your heart, not your head. Michael will often say to them, take your head off your shoulders, leave it on your pillow before you come in. I just want your hearts. And people are so caught up in their thought process. And instead of being in the moment and being right with them, where they can connect on an energetic level, they're like analyzing and, and you know, thinking thinking about what he's saying and where, where does that fit into the little box that they already are living in and whether they can believe it or not, instead of just opening from the heart and just being there and shutting the, shutting the mind down completely. And, and that, I think, is a very important factor for the participants to embrace when they, when they sit in during the five days. And that does happen the first day, maybe even the first two days, although it's happening much quicker now. People are very, very much into their heads. But after, by the halfway through the second day, 
Um, and then people just relax and they really get into their hearts and just some incredible, incredible experiences happen for people. It's such enriching and fulfilling work to do and to see this happen. It's, we love our job. What can I, I say? Think, I think <laughs> what Karen said about heads and hearts is, is the most relevant thing. You know, some people come to an intensive and we're looking right across the spectrum and I'm sure this happens with other people and other seminars and if you say something they didn't know, then they're immediately suspicious because it doesn't fit in their box. And others are completely the opposite. They want to hear things that they didn't know. Um, they don't want, they're not interested in things they do know. But because they think they, when I say because they do know it, knowing it and having the information are two very different things. And a lot of people have the information, shall we say, of how to live their life, but they don't live their life that way. I mean, let's just take it, a new age cliche, we all create our own reality. But does that mean everybody who knows and understands what that means has stopped creating a reality that doesn't hurt? Of course it doesn't. They still get involved in traffic jams and swearing and arguing and um, rows with their spouse or partner, etc., etc. And yet they know they create their own reality but they still go and blame other people. So having the information, as they say, I know that, it doesn't mean they know it. They don't know it at all. And often I look at them and smile and say, no, you have the information. You do not yet know it. Because when you're living it, then you know it. And like Karen has said, having the information and thinking you know is very, very different from actually living the reality of what you know. During the intensives, when people are going through so much in their lives, is there someone for them to talk to about things? Is there counseling involved with it also in one-on-one -on -one experiences, or is it the group experience? It's basically about the group experience. Um, a lot of one-on-one -on -one happens because Karen, as you can tell, is a wise woman. I think she was born wise. And she's um, a wise woman, so a lot of women chat with her, particularly women. Sometimes a man who's unable to do that or ask me if he can just have a, um, ask me something or can, um, we can talk about something. And so we do that. But I don't so much do counselling. I used to do that in the early days. But then, you know, I mean, I found that I was sort of busy from 8 in the morning till um, 9 or 10 at night. And that doesn't work for me, not when I'm in five continents and about 12 different countries. You know, we need something called sleep and relaxation also. But with that said, I mean, he doesn't, what he's saying is he doesn't do uh, what he does on the phone here or by Skype. We do, he does personal sessions for one hour with people either by phone or by Skype while we're at home. And we were doing that on the road, but it was just too overwhelming. We were having no downtime. But with that said, if people at the intensive are really struggling or if they're having a difficult time um, processing something and they aren't comfortable sharing it in front of the group, we always make ourselves available for them. Uh, it might not be for a full hour. It would never take a full hour but we were always there it's not like we just let them flounder on their own so there is a lot of support oh, we're personal, always there for personal people, support yes. in that way always absolutely always nobody is expected to just flounder along if they haven't a clue what I'm talking about but there is another thing that brings up some people say to me I don't understand now when you to understand you mean you've got to intellectually understand um, what you intellectually understand is not necessarily what I'm talking about. You know, what I'm talking about, I want people to heart feel it more than head understand. Because um, understanding doesn't mean anything soul. We live in a society that's based in, I need to understand. Understanding is very intellectual. The intellect needs, wants to understand. But there are many areas I talk about which people agree afterwards, the intellect cannot understand. However, the person on a soul level can experience and have a very deep level of knowing and still not intellectually understand. So we have an addiction to understanding, but just because you understand something, it doesn't mean to say that you actually have got it. In other words, what I'm getting at is this. 
somebody says, oh, yes, I understand, I understand, then the intellect says, oh, well, I must be right because I understand. So the arrogance of the intellect that it always assumes it's right if it understands something. I listen to a lot of people saying things that they understand that are completely wrong. And so just because you understand something, it doesn't mean therefore you're right. It means that you've now joined the collective understanding of an illusion. You know, most people say, well, of course I understand the past is finished. Actually, it isn't. And the past can be, um, you can change the past. And people say, well, I don't understand. Well, does that mean therefore you can't do it because you don't understand? And I've had people do it and didn't understand how it was working, but it still did work. I enjoy that. That's really fun. Thank you, both of you. The intensive sound, absolutely amazing. You also have many YouTube videos, and you also do these wonderful musings on Facebook for people to tap into your wisdom. Michael, I always enjoy that, and I always picture Carolyn by your side, and I always see you guys together in Australia as a team, which is very beautiful, and I think about the sole contract that the two of you have, and that you're living your mission and your commitment to share uh, your wisdom with others, the wisdom that you've gained, but uh, that wisdom was hard-earned, wasn't it, Michael? I, yeah, I mean, my path was pain and suffering. And, uh, and that's generally the human path today. And I actually get people writing to me from Facebook who are trying to justify that it's okay to suffer. And I just say, well, then suffer. If you need to justify it, then just suffer. But we do not need to grow through pain and suffering. We do. We do grow that way, but we don't need to. When you've gone through pain and suffering like I have, and you've only got to read my book that's just been republished, Getting There, and you'll realize that I know exactly what pain and suffering is. When you've been through all that, you realize none of it was necessary. It's all self-created, absolutely all self-created. Um, today, I choose unconditional love. Unconditional love is not loaded up with pain and suffering. It's about inner kindness. It's about being good to yourself. It's about treating yourself gently. And so I really, really am quite strongly against the pain, part of pain and suffering because I just see so many people beating themselves up endlessly and they think that's spiritual. That's nothing to do with spirituality. Yeah, but with that said, and I'm certainly not defending suffering because I agree with everything Michael said, but I think that there is a place for it in as much as it, it breaks down the walls of the ego. It breaks down the shell of the ego. Um, it, it makes you vulnerable. It, it, you, you let go of your defenses. When I was in the, the worst time of my life, I, I begged and pleaded and, and prayed and, and manipulated and did everything I could uh, and, and finally, finally, because I tried everything else, I just let go. And that's when the magic happens. That's when the miracles happen. And that's when the suffering ended, right? And that was when the suffering ended. So, But you have to suffer until you realize you don't have to suffer. Yeah, but the point is here. The point is here. Suffering is only based on resistance to change. Well, yes, yes, yes. So if you don't resist change, then we don't suffer. And it's also based on your perception. I mean, what is reality? It's really just perception. It's how exactly, you. It's, yeah. it's how you look at things. It's how you perceive things. You know, you can either tell yourself it's the best thing that ever happened, or it's the worst thing that ever happened. And then you know, you you jump on that emotional roller coaster, and you're off, depending on what you're telling yourself, what you're, how you perceive it to be. We're the space in which things happen. We're not the we're not the event that's happening. You know, we identify with. With, the, with, the, with our ego and, our, and our personality. We don't identify with, the, with our true self, with our true nature. And that's what we have to touch into. And when we realize that, that's discovering the part of us that never breaks, the part of our hearts that never breaks. And there resides just peace and freedom. See, this is why I married you. You're, you're so smart. Boy, well, I just didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday. I always tell <laughs> Can each of you please share a daily ritual or a daily habit that you've created or adopted that helps you tremendously? I know you, you both have very different personalities and you probably spend your days doing different things. Could you share with us a little bit of what that's like? 
Well, I, I have a little daily habit. Um, it's not so much a habit, but each day I've got a I've got a anklet I put on, and the anklet um, once at every hour it buzzes, and so when the anklet buzzes, that's to remind me to talk to my body and tell my body and every cell in my body how much I love it, how much I enjoy its help, how much I, how grateful I am that it's has eternal youth, etc., etc. I talk to my body very positively and very lovingly and very regularly, and I remind myself to do that because that's something that's easily forgotten in the thrust of time. I think for me, there, there's a couple things. One, on a daily level, I always, always focus on the sacredness of all life and the beauty of life and the miracle of life. Um, and of course, uh, of unconditional love. Now, I have to say, love for me, the way I can relate to it is, and I know you've, you've been pregnant, Caroline, and you know when you're pregnant, no matter what you're doing, you're always aware that you're pregnant. And love for me is that. I'm always so very, very aware of it. And one practice that I do do in the mornings, uh, in the stillness of the mornings, I, uh, I envision the, the globe, the planet. I used to do it just with people or situations, but now I, I, now I do it with the entire earth. And, and, I, and I encompass the earth in a, in a beautiful sphere. And I, and I connect and very deeply feel the love that I am coming through, through me and with all the beings of love and light here and with me now working through me. And I envelop and penetrate and permeate and saturate the earth and all things in it and on it uh, with, with love, with just love, just feel that love to the depths of my being. And that's my little blessing to the earth. That's beautiful. And I also have one other little habit. I, when I wake up in the morning, generally Carolyn is awake and we generally cuddle. And when we're, uh, whether we cuddle or not, I look at her laying there next to me, her silver hair spilled all over the pillow. And I think to myself, how blessed I am. Every pretty well every morning, I just look at look at her and think how absolutely and totally blessed I am. How fortunate! We both share that very much. I mean, we we live such a magical life. I mean, I, I'm I'm so grateful. We're both just so grateful. We're so grateful that we have each other and that we're that we're able to do this extraordinary work that we do. It's it's just you know you get to a point in consciousness and you and you step away from the me and you go into the we and our, our home is the planet and and we're just so so fortunate that we do what we do and we have each other to do it with yeah yeah very blessed that's so intensely beautiful i know every time i receive an email from carolyn the tremendous love uh that you send with Everything you do is just enormous, and it's like you're a beacon of glowing love. And I think everyone who meets you appreciates that tremendously. Thank she, you. She is my love teacher. She has love down to a fine art far more than I do. I do the best I can. But Carolyn is just love on two legs. I mean, she could look at a person that she could be sitting in a coffee shop and just jump up and she doesn't do this because people <laughs> can't do that. But she could run up to anybody walking by and look them in the eyes and say to them, I just love you so much. And it would be true. Wow. Whereas we're inclined to think that you've got to know the person and know their personality and like it all before you can love them. You know, I've got a son that doesn't speak to me, put me out of his life, but I still love him very, very deeply because it doesn't require him to be nice to, for me to love. You know, I love him because that's my choice. Um, he's, he's my biological son, and so that's my choice to love him. And so you don't, people sort of think, well, you can only love people if you know them and if they're nice to you, but it doesn't love work that way. And Carolyn particularly, she just loves everybody. I find that I do, but I couldn't go and declare it, whereas I know Carolyn could. I'd get arrested. <laughs> But you see the being they are. I mean, you can see the, I see the being they are. It's like I can go up and like lift up the mask off their face and say, I see you and I love you. I that see. is so well said. And, yeah, and, you could. Yeah, and I mean, it's, you, you look at them from a bigger picture. Yeah, love doesn't look just through the eyes. Love looks through the heart. 
I remember it many, many years ago in America, and we're going back 15, 18, 20 years when I was in America, was in New York, and I was doing a weekend talk. And um, there was an obese woman at about, um, I was just doing a weekend seminar, rather, and there was a very obese woman. And at lunchtime on the Saturday, the first day, she, um, she was standing looking very alone and spontaneously, uh, without thinking about it, I went up to her and gave her a hug. And I mean, she was very large. And I said to her, I love you. Now, that was very unusual in those days, 15 or 20 years ago, for me to say that, because I was very insecure in that area of love. But anyway, I said that. And then in the afternoon, she wasn't there. And next day, she didn't come, morning or afternoon. And I often um, berated myself, thinking I should never have said that to her. I obviously offended her. Well, six years passed. And this is how long ago it was. I got a letter from her long before emails came out, and she said, I don't know whether you remember me, but I'm the fat lady who came to the seminar in New York. I'm the fat lady who said to me, I love you. And she said, I just want you to know what happened. I thought you might like to know what happened. My God, I've been wanting to know for six years. And she said, when you said that to me, I knew you meant it. Well, I did mean it, actually even though it was unusual for me. I meant it. And she said, I knew you meant it. And she said, I went home and cried the whole afternoon. I cried all the next day, um, all day Sunday, she said, because nobody had ever looked me in the eyes and said to me, I love you. Not even my parents did it any longer. And she said, that moment changed my life. She said, I'd like you to know I'm no longer the fat lady on her own. I'm happily married. I've got two wonderful children. And I just want to say thank you because that moment changed my life. And I thought, boy, did ever I need to receive that letter. You just don't know what love can do. That's so beautiful. I'm crying right now. That's a beautiful story, Michael. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. It's just amazing. Oh, wow. We have said, had such an amazing time today talking with Michael and Carolyn Rhodes. And I invite everyone to visit their website, michaelrhodesusa.com and michaelrhodes.com. They are going to be traveling all over the world doing their intensives. They're amazing, absolutely amazing. And the information that you share and the love that you just that comes out of both of you is just life-changing and I, I thank you from deep in my heart for helping me navigate my own life tremendously and in creating a life that I absolutely love and enjoy every second of so thank you so much from from my heart well, from our heart to yours thank you for being thank there. you Caroline we're hugging you with all of our love right now <laughs> And I trust you can feel it. <laughs> can, um, can each of you share some closing words of wisdom? I know you've spoke so much. That would be so delightful. Well, words of wisdom. I, um, one of the things that I'm fairly intent on teaching people nowadays is where you focus your energy flows. And, of course, all energy flows there. But primarily, first of all, your energy flows. So, in other words, your focus is your thoughts and your emotions. And when your thoughts are angry, then you're an angry person and anger will be attracted to you and situations will be attracted to you to, to maintain the anger. Um, so if you're feeling loving and kind and, and that way, exactly the same happens. And also, in, in people, everybody gets it. We each create our own reality. But it's become very, um, very much a cliche and blasé and it doesn't sort of connect with people. And I have a very different way of putting that that really makes you connect with it. In every moment of your life, you are creating the direction and the content of every moment of your life. And when you really get that, you realize, okay, where I focus, my energy flows, and this is how, in every moment of my life, I'm creating the direction and the content of every moment of my life. Now, that's easy to understand intellectually. But when you really get it, when it really drops into place and you realize, oh my God, I'm sitting at a rest in a cafe, 
and I'm having a cup of coffee and I'm talking, and we're talking about what's wrong with the world, in reality, we're talking about what's wrong with our life. Because there is no world in consciousness to each one of us. Everything we relate to is the consciousness of us. So whatever we're talking about, we're actually talking about our own state of consciousness, but we're never realizing that. So when we're talking about, oh God, the world's a mess, and this is wrong, and that's wrong, and that governor, and gov the government's gone to pot, we're creating a focus that is negative and wrong. What is wrong and, and, and negative? That is our life. Um, that's what we're creating and putting in our life. You can't be avoided. So every moment you're sitting thinking, you're watching a movie and it's violent, you're now bringing violence into your life. And people say, rubbish, it's a movie. I know it's a movie. I'm sorry, but it doesn't work that way. What your brain tells you and what your life, what life will allow and give you as an experience are two completely different things. Life doesn't follow the thrust of your brain, it follows the thrust of your being. And when you realize that life is an inside of self-event and not an outside of self-event, then you begin to really, really get it, how you create it yourself. You're the creator of your life to the every degree, every part of it. And, and that's worth remembering. And, and if you know that and remember that, you can't blame anybody for anything because you created it. Now, litigation in America 20 years ago, there was one every 15 seconds. It's probably now down to every five seconds. It's the same in Australia. It's the same in Europe. Litigation, somebody taking somebody to court because they blame them. This is the world of illusion we live in. We create every part of our lives, and nobody else to blame, not for anything. And I know that's a very leading statement. Wow, that was beautiful, Michael. Thank you so much for sharing that. Carolyn, can you share some closing <laughs> words of wisdom? Thank you. Yes, Carolyn. That's a, I guess that's quite, quite a thing to follow there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, be, I'll keep it simple. Um, I think I would just suggest just, just be gentle with yourself. You know, I think a lot of people feel yeah. that they're too spiritual to, to feel anger or to feel fear. And, and it all comes under the umbrella of divinity. It all does. And if you, just, if you just are gentle with yourself and just love yourself, just give yourself to love. Just let it all go. It's, you know, love and life and God and you know, all those words, nature, they're all interchangeable. It's just, it's just giving yourself to that, that God spark within and, and just letting it be. And it's just incredible how, how life just works itself out. Things just melt like butter on a hot knife. And, to, and just to take, take yourself lightly, take life lightly, and note ever, ever, ever don't lose your sense of humor. Thank you both so much deeply for sharing your beautiful message of unconditional love today and every day. It is always a delight to connect with you and I absolutely love you. Thank you so much for being on Spirit of the Dawn today. And thank you very much to Spirit of the Dawn for having us to dawn your spirit. Yes, thank you, Carolyn. Thank you for having us. And thank you to everyone that's listening. Absolutely. <laughs> We're sending yeah. you all love from down under. I wish to thank Brian, Zach, and Synergy for the use of their song, Embrace the Change. I thank all of you for joining with us. I invite you to visit spiritofthedawn.com for more inspirational interviews. Sending love from my home to yours, I am Pleiadian Emissary of Life, Caroline Ross.